Hello and welcome to A Problem Squared. I'm Beck Hill. And I'm Matt Parker. And we're here to solve your problems. <laughs> <laughs> Slick. We are in no way out of practice. Oh my goodness. It's been a while, Beck. What happened? Yeah, okay. So we were supposed to record our last episode before the end of February. And then I came back from Brussels Comic Con. I'd had a wonderful weekend. And then on the way back, got really ill, like properly really bad fever, headaches, cough, trouble breathing. And then when I was coming through customs at the Eurostar, they had all the posters that were saying, do you have these symptoms? And I was like, yeah, but it's not coronavirus. And then it was like, have you been in any of these countries recently? And Hong Kong was on the list. And I was like, yeah, but only through the airport. Like, like, yeah, yeah. I was, I was barely in Hong Kong. I only walked past a couple hundred people while I was there. Yeah, yeah. And also, I didn't wear a mask because I thought that was stupid. And um, yeah, then I felt like an idiot. And so I, I went home and I called NHS Direct and I did what the poster told me. And then they called me back and took down my symptoms and they're like, yeah, we're sending an ambulance to your place. Wow. And I felt so ill as well. Like apparently the coronavirus for people in my situation, like my age bracket and normal physical health, the symptoms aren't as bad as a bad flu. <laughs> so right. the nurses were saying weird things like, I bet you wish you had coronavirus. <laughs> and, I, and this was still when we didn't know that much about it. So I was like, oh, what a weird thing to say. I want to make this clear. This is before all the coronavirus stuff really kicked off. Yeah, I was like quarantining before it was cool. <laughs> and so you kind of like rang me up and you're like, so I'm very ill and I was in Hong Kong recently and I'm like, I would like you to not come down to the studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I was in like a proper quarantine where they had to get all dressed up on the way in and like I felt like E.T. It was amazing. Wow. Okay. So we want to hear all about this. Yes. So, so we are now recording much later in March. Yes. And this is going to be our quarantine virus episode. Yes. But if people are sick of that content which let's be honest there's a lot out there right now we will be releasing the march episode as normally scheduled on the last day of march and we're going to record that today as well yeah yeah so stick around and there will be a non-coronavirus episode yeah if, if, if you're sick of hearing about the coronavirus and quarantine then we've tested the next episode and it's it's come back clear it has no viral load whatsoever <laughs> So it's entirely safe to listen to if you're sick of hearing about that. But otherwise, we thought we'd go all in and make this a quarantine special. Yeah. Covering problems such as, what should you take if you're quarantined in hospital? <laughs> it's a very specific problem, but one that you're now qualified to comment on. Yep. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, top tips for working from home. And we're also going to look at the mathematics behind the infection rate of the coronavirus and check out whether some of the things going around are correct. One thing I've learned is that if you guys infect other people by telling them about this podcast, we could get many, many more listeners during this isolation period. Oh, yes, yes. Please, please do share this podcast uh, wherever you can, but just not in person. Our first problem for Beck is one that you've now got a lot of experience of, and that's what happens if you actually get quarantined in a hospital. So not, like we're all self-isolating and working from home and doing all those things. We'll deal with that in a moment. But in the extreme case, if you get dragged into hospital, I'm curious, because you know, hopefully it won't happen to anyone listening, but if it does happen, what do you take? What goes on? Any recommendations? Okay, so the first thing about hospital quarantine, and obviously I'm just speaking about the hospital I went to, there's nothing in there. Like there's a bed and a bathroom and a sink and that's it. That's it. Like there's no TV. Oh, I had a window, but that's it. Uh, that's nature's TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the plus side is if you're quarantined in a hospital, chances are you're so sick that you don't need anything else. So I slept the whole time and I had so many people saying to me, because obviously this is before everyone was in isolation, saying, oh, what I would give to be in quarantine or have an excuse not to talk to people and just get some work done. And I was like, I'm not getting work done. I slept for the whole three days I was in there. 
I sweated. Actually, that's a really good point because you had a pretty serious case of the flu. Yeah. And for anyone who's not had the, like, because I used to throw around, oh, I might have the flu. I'm feeling a bit fluey. And then about three years ago, I got the flu and I it floored me for a week. Yeah. And it was horrific. So, so you had all that going on at the same time. Yeah, because you're like, you feel like you're dying. And then I think the worst part is you get through the worst symptoms in a couple of days, but then it takes so long to properly shake them. Like I had a cough for a solid two weeks and a proper cough, like a guttural cough. And that was when everything was picking up with the virus stuff. So I couldn't go outside, not only because I was still trying to get better, but also just because anytime I coughed, people around me were like... (laughs) Just scatter. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It was pretty full on. So yeah, it was a bad flu. I was very, very ill. So if you get quarantined, I wouldn't worry so much about taking entertainment. I did actually take my tablet. I didn't take it out of my bag once. Oh, wow. I barely looked at my phone. I think I even took a book, which is so dumb because, again, I didn't want to look at anything. I just slept for the whole time and sweated and felt sad. Because I messaged you about halfway through and I was like, how are you doing? Do you need a phone call? Because I know normally if Beck's not talking, then you're going to be very sad. The amount of people who said to me, I know you're ill because you aren't talking. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's how you know I'm sick when I ain't rambling. So I would suggest if you're put into quarantine, just some practical things, really. Toothbrush and toothpaste, you can get them from the hospital. But if you've got a preferred toothbrush, like uh, we talked about in a previous episode, I would pack that. And your favorite sort of toiletries in terms of shampoo and conditioner when you're well enough to shower. Again, the hospital provides it, but it's all in these little sample pack type things and you've got to rip them open. And have you ever tried to open those packets of like shampoo and conditioner or whatever with wet hands? Yes. And I I can't do it. The little, little sachets. And the problem is if it's like food stuff. I'm like, well, I'll use my teeth, right? Yeah. Shampoo or soap, I'm like, ah, oh, now that's like the only weapon in my arsenal is teeth and I'm out. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. And I suspect you were in before the big rush. So I'm imagine replenishing like complimentary sachets of conditioner are going to be way down the list of priorities for hospitals now. Yeah. So I would say take your own toiletries. Take a couple of pairs of nice warm socks to keep your feet warm. Take a spare blanket. I didn't take things like that because I thought they might try and like incinerate them all because I didn't quite understand how the the illness was working. But again, they have spare blankets, but they're all really thin and they've got more important things to do. So I wish I'd taken a spare blanket and I wish I'd taken a a pair of uh, actual day clothes because I went in my pajamas and I had a spare pair of pajamas, but I didn't have any clothes clothes like for outside right so your only option was pajamas yeah so when i went home they knew i had a flu and they knew that was probably the cause of the symptoms but i hadn't been cleared of coronavirus but because they were like well there's nothing we can do in hospitals like we can't cure it so there's no point having you taking up a bed here (laughs) out you go (laughs) we'll send you we'll send you home to get better but because they didn't know if I had coronavirus yet, they sent me home in an ambulance, which means I was still in my pajamas and everything. And that's fine. But if I'd been cleared of coronavirus while still at the hospital, they would have wanted me to walk home because if you're sick, they don't want you catching a cab or anything because then you might give the flu to the cab driver. Like it's really yeah. unfair. So they're like, you know, if you're well enough, You should walk home. And I had nothing that would allow that. I mean, to be fair, I didn't want to walk home anyway because I felt like death. But, you know, if you're in a position where you're feeling well enough that you could walk, bear in mind that that might be the option to do. Right. So it's all toiletries, blankets, pajamas. Clothes. Clothes. And I know in your case, it was only one specific hospital and this was early on, but could you have got someone to have dropped these things off? Like what's, what's the deal? Actually, we probably should start coming up with plans for things like that as well. So when they didn't know if they'd actually be able to get an ambulance to drop me home, they actually said, do you know anyone who'd be able to drive you home who doesn't need the car for two weeks? Because basically they would have to drive me home and then leave it. Quarantine the car? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Because um, 
they or, or at least like you don't want anyone else going in there and getting it while the virus is still alive. Yep. So I didn't know anyone who would be like that. And also they were sort of saying, you know, do you know anyone who could bring you clothes? But they couldn't bring them from my house because my house had been quarantined because if oh, I had course. coronavirus all my gems would be everywhere. So they were like, no one should go to your flat. <laughs> They'll have to bring different clothes. So I think... It's also worth just bearing in mind uh, any friends who would be willing to help out in those types of situations. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Wow. And have a comparable sized friend who can bring you spare clothes in an emergency. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting is they'd done the swab tests in my mouth and they'd done the blood tests, but they also brought me a little vial because I was coughing so violently and they brought me a little vial and they said, if you cough up any phlegm, can you put it in this vial? Uh. And I didn't cough up any phlegm during this time. It just rattled around, but it never came up. And I'm guessing it was to see if they could... Test it? Yeah. I don't know if they can test it faster or I don't know what the deal is, but they wanted some. Maybe it's, maybe I just had a weird nurse it's who was probably, obsessed. It's probably... That's an option. <laughs> so the thing I would say is maybe take something that you could put in the phlegm flask that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like... That's great. Just like, if you do take your own toiletries, pop some like shampoo or something in there. No phlegm, but I coughed up a very small Lego uh, person. Does yeah, that... yeah, yeah. Any miniatures you have, Dungeons and Dragons stuff. I mean, can you imagine if you had like a little figurine in there? Oh, that's great. <laughs> if you did, though, if like you were like, oh, here you go, I coughed up some phlegm and you give them a small vial of Worcester sauce. Like how? <laughs> With... <laughs> this guy oh, really it's... likes a Worcester sauce. <laughs> And from what I hear, when hospitals and the NHS is overloaded, what all the, the medical staff really want is just a bit of a laugh. Just someone playing some casual pranks. <laughs> Wasabi. Like something that looks like phlegm. But then they were like, oh, this is powerful. <laughs> ah, back we found that you don't have coronavirus, but you do have sushi samba. <laughs> you do go very well with sushi, yeah. So there you are. There you are. Beck, I, I, I think apart from possibly pranking NHS staff, um, that's good advice and a problem solved. Ding! Our next problem comes from a few of you, actually, a few listeners, who wanted to know what our tips for working from home are. And I feel like we're qualified to answer that because we both work from home anyway a lot of the time. Yeah, like we do have to travel a lot and we out in the evenings, but during the days we're doing all the admin that prepares us for the other stuff. I don't know about you, but I've had all my live work cancelled and so I am working from home, but it's not often I work from home for such an extended period of time because normally I've got other gigs and shows and things I'm going off and doing, whereas now I've got, there's two holdout events that haven't cancelled between now and like June, July-ish, like every, every, like my tour has been postponed, all my school work has been cancelled, and now it's just working from home. Yeah, there's a comedian called Jos Norris who tweeted, and I thought he perfectly put it when he said, he's been more social since everyone's been put into self-isolation than he's ever been in his life because everyone wants to FaceTime right now. Everyone wants to FaceTime, everyone wants to talk. Like all the meetings you would normally have either in person or via email, for some reason, people who are normally in offices are now like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're free for a FaceTime later. Everyone wants to FaceTime. <laughs> and it's like, I've done more phone calls in the last few days than I have in years. I wonder how long that's going to last because it is good advice from working from home is to keep in touch with other people, you know, chat to other humans, all that. But I think a lot of people are front-loading it. Oh, yeah. Everyone's gone to 100%. I had a 45-minute FaceTime yesterday that could have been a one-paragraph email. Yeah, see, exactly, exactly. And it's all well and good, but I, I, if we're in this for a minimum of, let's say, eight weeks, you want to stagger your uh, social interaction or we're all going to be exhausted pretty quick. Yeah, so that's one hint. <laughs> one hint, one hint, one hint. Don't don't over socialize too fast. Mm -hmm. But the closest I get to this is sometimes Lucy, my wife and I, will occasionally be writing books at the same time. And so we've gone on like writing retreats where we'll hire a tiny cottage in the middle of nowhere, as long as it's got internet, and we'll go there and we'll just write for like a week or two at a time. And so so far this just feels like doing that. And when we do that, we still try and put like a, a semi-routine, like we get up 
by a certain time, we start work at a set time, and then we try and finish at a particular time. And so I think we've just kind of fallen into that rhythm. That, Except like you're saying. I love how you said that. And I, I was like, oh, how this time is reminding you of, you of when you're in a writer's retreat in a cottage. Meanwhile, I'm sat in, my, in a cupboard, a literal cupboard surrounded by jackets. Because we're literally working from home right now. And you're in the understairs cupboard in your house. Yeah. And my flat is so small that it's not even our stairs. It's the neighbor above us. <laughs> You're under someone else's stairs. It's their stairs, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you say the thing about having a routine, though, because yep. I find that is something that I had to develop myself when I was teaching myself how to work from home when I first went full-time comedy. So what's your routine at home? So, I mean, it used to be just wait until something needs to be done and then get dressed, which sometimes was never, and I would stay in my pajamas all day. But now I, I do have a pretty good routine. I've got a big whiteboard that has a checklist that I have to fill out every day. Ooh, nice. Uh, and it consists of, I do morning pages every morning when I wake up, which is three pages of stream of consciousness writing, which for me is a mental health thing. It's just a nice way of skimming off any anxieties or anything off the top of your head so that the rest of the day you feel a bit more with it. Um, it's quite a nice reflective practice to do. And then, so I have to do that first thing. I'm not allowed to look at my phone or anything before I've done that. You're very disciplined. Goodness. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's hard. It's, um, it's not an easy thing. It's not something I have to consciously decide to do it on a daily basis, but I always feel better afterwards. So that's what usually helps. I have a stay focused app on my phone, which means that I don't get WhatsApp messages or emails or anything until after 10 a.m. And then after 10 p.m. it blocks all of the things I would normally use oh, nice. to distract myself because otherwise I have all that input and I have trouble sleeping. So if I go to open Twitter after 10 p.m., it's like, nope, can't do it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I should be winding down and getting ready for bed. Because I'll still allow myself to watch TV and stuff, but it just stops yeah. an element of excitement when I'm like, oh, I've thought of a new joke. I'm going to check my notifications for the next two hours. Yep, yep, And yep. so, yeah, so I have that. I try and do 30 minutes of creative play, whether it's drawing or doodling or writing or sticking stuff together or whatever. The idea is that you do something without the point, without having... A point, a goal. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's fun. So I've started painting. Wow. And then just things like getting dressed. I've got go outside as one of my checklist things because I don't go outside. And obviously it's even harder right now. So physically I have to open the door and step outside and then go back in the house. And then I get to tick it off. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Well, we've started walking to work. However, obviously we live where we work. So in the morning we get up, we kind of get ready for the day. And I refuse to look at my email before I'm officially starting work. Even though I've got it on my phone, I just mm. will not open the email app. So I just, I haven't got a fancy way of doing it. I just, um, I only look at Twitter and things like Reddit and stuff in the morning on my phone. Then we walk around the block and it's a 20 minute walk. We go out the front door, we go left, we walk all the way around the block, we get back and then we start work. And that's now our day at work. And at the end of the day, when we decide we're finished work, we walk the other way back around the block. So we'll go out the front door, go right, go around the other way, reversing our journey, and then we're home. That's very cute. It's both giving us exercise and punctuating the day, which we've found very useful. I don't know if we should be encouraging it, though, because if everyone went out and did that, assuming that everyone works roughly the same working hours, there's going to be a lot of people walking past each other in a time when we're supposed to be isolating. <laughs> Well, the advice is you can still go for walks and get exercise. So we passed three people on the walk this morning and we gave them all a wide, bordering on offensively wide berth. I have seen more people walking outside in my cul-de-sac than I have at any other time. Really? Yeah, I think because people aren't at work and the kids aren't at school. So everybody's walking around outside. That largely defeats the purpose. Yeah, no, I know, totally. My solution for people working from home who need to keep moving, this is a challenge I put up on Twitter. And by the time this airs, I should have a video in reply up and I invite you to join in with this. The Eurovision, I believe, is being cancelled this year. Yeah, very sadly. And Iceland had an incredible entry with a song called Think About Things. And their video has an amazing dance. Wow. 
I've not heard or seen this yet. Well, it's simple but hard enough that it takes a few goes to to get your head around. Okay. So I've challenged myself and others to learn the dance and I'm going to go a step further and try and recreate their music video <laughs> and uh, post it in reply to that tweet. So if you go through my tweets, you should be able to find I might pop it on Instagram and stuff as well. In fact, I'll put it on the A Problem Squared Instagram account at A Problem Squared. So this is our official advice is to learn this dance as a way to get exercise if you can't go for a walk without bumping into other humans. Yes. Okay. That and create a schedule that you have to tick off. Got it. So if you want to see Beck's attempt or at least her initial challenge, it'll be at Beck Hill Comedian, I believe, on Twitter. Yeah. Or on A Problem Squared. And for the record, I will look up the video and have a look at this. It sounds very exciting. The song sounds great. Uh, Sadly, because we're not having a Eurovision party this year, that's pretty much all I've got left. Uh, However, because I can still walk around the block, I will not be partaking in the learning and filming of the dance. That's a real shame. Not for me. I feel like you've let down not only our listeners, but also yourself. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. (laughs) Oh, I've already decided what I'm going to call the video. Yep. It's going to be my ISO land entry for Eurovision. ISO, like isolation land. Yeah, and it's like Iceland. Because I hear ISO and I think like consistent or unchanging, but that's um, <laughs> that's the maths. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I feel like with all this in mind, we should provide some proper HUD solutions for our listeners. Oh, actual pragmatic advice. Yeah. So to refine what we've all discussed, Matt. What is your tip for getting up at a reasonable time? For me, it's a knock-on effect. It's just having a schedule the rest of the time because otherwise I will keep working in the afternoon. I will work into the early evening. I won't eat until late and then I go to bed late and I struggle to get up. Get yourself jet lag. Exactly. And my body clock slips so easily. So forcing a routine to stop work means I can keep a routine for going to bed. And I've just been setting an alarm for 7.30 every morning. And Lucy and I take turns of making the other person waking up. So we're kind of division of labor on that one. If it helps anyone else listening who struggles like me, especially during the times when it's still dark outside, I have one of those SAD lamp alarms where it over half an hour slowly gets brighter and brighter, which means that by the time I wake up, there's a bit more light in the room. It's a bit harder to fall back asleep. That is very clever. Okay, Beck, what's your advice for staying focused? Oh, don't talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that's Definitely. literal practical advice for me don't phone back that's like an hour wasted yeah i think if you're working from home create a dedicated workspace oh that's good so an area that is specifically for work preferably away from a relaxation area so if possible try not to work in your bedroom or from your couch because mentally that should be a place that you relax and if you start mixing them across yeah it can be comfortable working from your bed or your couch and I'm not judging you if you are but it might for some of you make it harder to then relax later because your brain is still connecting that to work so for me I have a tiny flat so my off is actually in my kitchen because there is a, an end of the kitchen that does not have kitchen appliances in it. So I've got a desk and craft cupboards and stuff in there and I work next to the window in my kitchen. And when I'm done, I go into the lounge and don't sit back at the desk. Yeah, you've cleared out a proper nook in in the kitchen where you work. I love my... De- it's an old drinks cabinet and it is proper gorgeous. I've popped a video up on my Instagram stories as well. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put some pictures up on the A Problem Squared Instagram page just because I'm really proud of it. And we're aware there's a certain level of, you know, assumed privilege. We've all got rooms and the places we can go. I know a lot of people are, are like, if you're sharing a house, a lot of people are trapped. They can only mm, work from their bedroom and all yes, these things. Yeah. And it's tough. Create a corner. Yeah, create a corner. We did this uh, years and years and years ago when Lucy and I were in this tiny place. We went down to a hardware store and bought a wallpaper table which is like the cheapest horizontal surface we could find and then I cut it in half to make it a bit more manageable and just balance that in a corner of our room and that just became the dedicated working writing zone so anything we could do to just have slightly different over there's where we work over here's where we relax makes a difference so yeah highly recommended yeah yeah absolutely 
I'm also interested to see what listeners have done. So if anyone has a little dedicated workspace area now or you've had one for a while because you work from home normally, send us a tweet at a problem squared. Send us a tweet with a photo of your workspace that I'll get a little thread going or something. I love seeing that stuff. Nice. And we'll both take a photo of us in our workspaces. Yeah. And we'll put the we'll, we'll, we'll get the ball rolling. You can see me in the cupboard. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to do your cupboard and your kitchen. Yeah. Your your studio and your office uh, locations. And mine's kind of an all in one job. Do a little tour. Give us a little tour. I'll give you a little tour. I'll do a little video tour of my office and we'll put that up. So I think that's a problem solved. Ding. For my final problem, I'm aiming this to you, Matt, because I've been seeing a lot of memes and infographs going around about the infection rate of the Ah, uh, COVID-19. Yeah. And I don't know which ones to believe or, you know, because I know that you're all about checking your sources and stuff. Exactly. Um, There's one in particular I've got here, which I'll post up on a problem squared on Instagram. We can pop it onto Twitter as well. It says the power of social distancing And it says now, and it's got one person, and it has an arrow that says infects. And then it says five days, 2.5 people infected. And then it says after 30 days, 406 people are infected. That's a lot of people. Then it says 50% less exposure. So I'm guessing that's if you decide to see half of the people every day that you would normally see. Yeah, if you contact or walk past half as many people, yeah. Then it says one person and it says after five days they infect 1.25 people, which to me that makes sense mathematically. Cause yep, half of 2.5, that, I'll give you that, yeah. Yep. Uh, and then it says after 30 days only 15 people are infected. And it's got a graphic showing that's way fewer people than the 406. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're infecting two and a half people, yeah. And then on the last frame, it says 75% less exposure, which again, I think is if you're self-isolating as much as you can. One person and then after five days infects 0.625 0.625 people. For people not doing the calculation, that's half of 1.25. They've just halved. Yeah, people. which also does not make sense because you cannot affect, infect less than a human. If that person is 0.625 of a person, they are already dead. That's, that's a good point. You've got bigger medical issues if you're down to 0.625. Yeah, good point. Actually, I say that. I'm just proving myself because I remember saying that you could lose quite a lot of your own body mass and sell your organs oh, in that's the first true. episode. Good point. So do you know what? I take it back. You probably could infect 0.625 of a person, but I will argue that they are probably dealing with some bigger issues. Well, they've got some and... major money issues that they've had to sell that much of themselves. But that's, yeah. uh... <laughs> And then after 30 days, it says only 2.5 people are infected. Yeah. And... I'm the sort of person who I think is like most people that these infographs are aimed at in that I look at that and I go, yeah, that sounds about right. That looks right. But I'm not the sort of person to check the maths behind this. So I wanted to ask you to solve the problem of the maths of infection. Well, this is my time to shine because I have checked this. So I looked it up and the first step with checking a meme is just where does it come from? And they were nice enough. They've burnt their Twitter handles into the meme image itself. And obviously that can get cropped off or whatever. But I was able to look up uh, Singner Lab. And that is at the University of California in San Diego. It's a researcher there, Robert Singer. It's, It's their lab, right? And so for the first step, it comes from a reputable source. But then I was like, well, how do they do these calculations? And so I sat down and I managed to crack it. It took me a little while to try and work out how they were doing the calculation and if I think it makes sense. And I've got a spreadsheet here that I've got working. So I'm just resetting it to 2.5 infection rate. So what they're basically saying is, if you get the coronavirus, you're infectious for a five-day window. And again, I've not fact-checked that, but that feels about right with what I've seen online. And so if you're infectious for five days, there's a thing called the R0 or R0 infection rate. And that's the average number of people an infected person will infect over the entire time that they are infectious. So you're right to point out fractions of people. And in fact, when you do the calculations, you always have to keep in fractional amounts of people. But you've got to remember that's an average. Right. So you're right. No one individual can infect two and a half people. But if you've got a bunch of people who are infectious, then it can be an average of two and a half. 
And so because mm. you're doing these as average numbers, you've got to keep the fractions of humans, um, even though it seems ridiculous. But they've rounded it at the very end. So there are 406 people infected. That should actually be 406.23 people. Oh. But to avoid these sorts of things, they've, they've just rounded it off. Um, so, so it's good. It's a good balance of going into the detail in the infographic, but also rounding it and making it easier to understand. So I'm, I'm very impressed with what they've done. So what they've done is start by assuming initially only one person has the disease. And over the course of five days while they're infectious, another two and a half people catch it from them, which means at the end of that week, there's now three and a half people who have the disease. One person who's no longer infectious, but they have had it. And two and a half people who've just caught it. And then a week later, you've still got the original person who's now gotten better. You've got the two and a half people, they've gotten better, but they've infected an average of two and a half people each. So two and a half times two and a half, two and a half squared is six and a quarter. There's now six and a quarter people who are infectious. So it's trickle down virus. Yeah. And so what you end up doing, for those of you who are curious about the mathematics, is you end up just adding the powers. So they've done it for 30 days, but it's five day windows. So they've actually done it for the first six intervals. And what they've done is the one person plus the infection rate, plus the infection rate squared, plus the infection rate cubed, plus it to the power of four, power of five, power of six. So they're adding that series of powers of the infection rate to get you the total number of cases so far. And there's a slightly important distinction. Some graphics will show you new cases and some show you all the cases so far. So that famous plot, the kind of the flatten the curve and keep it underneath the capacity of the health service, that's a plot of new cases, right? which is why you want it, it gradually goes back down to zero mm -hmm. and you get other plots like this, which is the total number of people who have had it so far. Okay. So when it says 406 people infected, it means infected in total, including the first person, but it's not... 406 people who are contagious. No, at that point, only 244 of those people will still be contagious. And Which is still a lot. Them, That's still, still a lot, still a lot more lot. than there was than the original first person. Exactly, exactly. So it's just always a case of looking at the stats and going, is this total people who have had it or is this people who've got it recently and are still infectious? Okay. And there is a side point to this, which is eventually you run out of people to infect. Yeah. And so all the math that's in this meme and the math that I've recreated is just assuming there's a much bigger population of people out there. There's actually a slight difference between what's called an exponential growth to something called logistical or logistic growth, which is where you then have to factor in the size of the population and that you're running out of new people to infect. Yeah. But given this is all about the start of the infection, they're identical. So uh, exponential is fine. Then what gets interesting so what the point they're kind of trying to make is a slight difference in how many people you infect on average makes a big difference to the total number of people who are infected later and the graphic's great but what it's not showing is the other scary thing about exponential growth so one thing that's scary about exponential growth is how big it gets and this just absolutely explodes but what it's not showing is the fact that it starts off deceptively small and slow and then nothing has to change and suddenly it'll explode. And there's no, nothing, nothing's changed. It's the same infection rate, but it goes from being almost unnoticeable to exploding. So I've got an example where I looked up estimates for the R0, the infection rate of coronavirus. And again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not medically qualified. My Googling, people seem to estimate it's between one and a half and three and a half. And the reason why it's such a big range is because if people do social distance and if these things are controlled, you make a big difference to the infection rate. But if it was three and a half, I've got an analogy here. So let's say you're at home mm -hmm. and you've got some rice. And rice is like, mathematically, that's like the famous example for exponential growth is putting rice because it starts small and, and suddenly accumulates. And historically, for some reason, it's always been rice, which is kind of fun. <laughs> so if, if let's say you got some rice, and the first day you throw uh, one grain of rice into your living room. Okay. And the next day you throw in three and a half times as much. So you throw in three and a half. Uh -huh. And the next day you throw in three and a half times as much as the previous day. A week later, 
you will only have 180 milliliters of rice in your living room. Oh. And you're like, oh, that's not so, oh, that, that's fine, that's fine. In fact, up to yeah. two weeks, you'll have about a meter cubed. Which, don't get me wrong. It's quite a lot of rice. It's quite a lot of rice. It's a big pile of rice. I would notice that in my living room. You'd notice it, but it's manageable. Hmm. After three weeks, your house would be full. Like, there would not be a single empty space in your house after three weeks. Wow. And after a month, after 33 days, you'd have enough rice to fill every single house in the UK. That's a lot of rice. That's a lot of rice. Think about all the fixed phones. Yeah, I know. Oh, there'd be no moisture in any phone anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it goes from being quite benign, like, oh, a little bit of rice, that's fine. It's manageable. And you're not mm. changing the rate at which you're increasing how much rice you're throwing in. It just hits the explosive part of the exponential curve and just races away right at the end. It just it explodes. However, if you did the same experiment, but you were at the lower bound, 1.5 times as much each day and and that's kind of the lower bound of what we think coronavirus is doing at the moment after three weeks instead of filling your house you'd only have 200 milliliters of rice hmm. and after 33 days where previously you would have filled every house in the uk you would have about 39 liters which is still a lot it's, it's still a lot but it's less than a bathtub you know it's like you know 22 liter bottles of milk like it's containable yeah. it's not every single house in the uk and so what I think is particularly scary about exponential growth is it starts off slowly. Yeah. And you never you don't notice it and it feels manageable. But if you don't change the infection rate, then it's going to explode. Yeah. But the other thing is if if you don't change the infection rate early on, it's not as important what the infection rate is. It's when it hits that explosive bit. So you'll see things like in the UK where they were dragging their feet on closing schools. Mm. because they're worried suddenly you'll have fewer healthcare workers because they their kids aren't in school and so they've got childcare concerns. Mm. But then what you need to do is you've got to squash the infection rate when you're hitting the explosive part of the growth. And if you don't, it makes such a big difference. Like the slightest change in that infection rate makes a huge difference to the rate at which the growth happens at so so the meme yeah. checks out but it's even a bit more terrifying than that infographic is showing and so that that's yeah. why everyone's banging on about social distancing it does make a huge difference i think if kids have to stay home without anyone to look after them give them a bathtub of rice there you go give them 39 liters of rice get them to count that ah oh, that'll be grand that's food entertainment what else do you need there you go it's an exponential amount of rice so there you are i hope me and my spreadsheet have managed to solve that problem for you. I would say absolutely that is a problem solved. Excellent. Ding! And that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. We very much appreciate it. And thank you so much to everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. It means we can keep making these things. We've had to buy some extra kit now. Yeah. So we can record back properly at home. So, you know, costs are ongoing. And actually, to be honest, if you are someone who's fortunate enough to still have a regular income and you're working from home, fine. If you can support artists, I mean, not just us, but people who normally perform for a living are now really feeling the pinch. So if you can support, I mean, us included, but any artists or people on Patreon so they can keep doing what they do and they can make it through this, that would be hugely appreciated. And, and thank you so much to all our very generous supporters already. Yeah, if you do have a normal source of income at the moment, any money that you are saving from not going out and not attending things and not going to movies. Yeah. Yeah. We're not saying spend more on the arts. Just keep spending on the arts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And also so many people, not just us, are putting out more online content so that those of you who are self-isolating do have things to keep you entertained while you're at home. So keep an eye out for those things as well and different ways of supporting everyone. And we're still putting stuff on our Instagram? Yeah. So uh, I don't know if I mentioned it enough in this episode, but uh, our Instagram is at a problem squared. And we also have a Twitter, which is at a problem squared. Yeah. So please do uh, check out what we're doing. Send us your photos of your workspaces. And I'm going to put some details in the show notes, all my assumptions. Uh, so like for the record, <laughs> uh, all my calculations were based on long grain rice. There you are. <laughs> and I assume 
that Beck lives in a 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter empty void cube. That was my assumption for uh, Beck's apartment. Wow, you've given yeah. me such high ceilings. <laughs> well, you know, I just it simplified the calculations. And so there you are. I don't know where the cupboard under the stairs fits in that, but I, I, I assumed you live in an empty cube. You know what? I am actually going to measure uh, my flat as best I can after this to see. Oh, that's really interesting. Whether your assumption was correct. Oh, no, I'm super curious. We'll do that. And we'll talk about it in the next episode. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Well, it won't be the next one because we're about to record that one. And that's going to be virus free. Yeah, no, it'll be in that one. I'll, I'll do it in our break. Are you going to do it? You're going to do it right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, deal. Okay, right. You do that. We'll record the next one. Everyone, thank you for listening. Please get the next episode when it comes out on the last day of the month like normal.